Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Neo4j online meetup. This is number 25, I think. Uh, and so uh, in case you've uh, not come across me before, my name is Mark. Uh, I work in the Neo4j uh, Dev Relations team in London. Um, and with me today, we've got uh, Christoph Willemsen from GraphAware and his Alexa. So Christoph, I guess I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself and, uh, and let us know what you're going to talk about today. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to be here tonight. Thanks, Mark, for the invitation. Uh, I'm here not alone, of course. I'm here with uh, uh, my friend, Alexa. Say hello. Hi. All right, so she presented. Um, so about me, I'm uh, Chris. I'm uh, um, from Belgium, but living in Italy now. I'm principal consultant at Graphware, and I do graphs and search mainly. And since the time now, I'm researching uh, in natural language understanding and its uh, implementation into chatbots. And I'm also, uh, in my part time, um, a professional member of the Association for Voice Interaction Design. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to speak about uh, chatbots and mostly voice bots um, with Alexa. I will explain uh, what we do with natural language understanding and how we do it with Neo4j. Um, and for the demo purpose, we will actually create um, assistant for a conference uh, where we can ask questions about session speakers um, to uh, demo all the theory in the slides. Uh, first, um, chatbots history. So this is a very, very um, historical picture in computer science. So this is uh, the Alan Turing test. Um, what does it say is that uh, there is a computer and a human having a conversation. And if there is a third person in involved. This person is analyzing the conversation. And if the person cannot guess who is the human and who is the a computer, then the program is passing the Turing test. Um, the first uh, bot having passed the Turing test is actually Elisa in 1966, who was actually simulating a therapist. Um, in 1972, there, is, there was an advanced version of ELISA, which was called Parry. And it was simulating a person with uh, schizophrenia. And there were a lot, a lot of um, other chatbots or bots uh, afterwards. Uh, like in our era, the most famous is IBM Watson having won the GeoParty uh, in 2006. And then came Siri, Google, and Alexa, of course. And, Let's ask um, when she came on the market. Alexa, how old are you? I was first released on the 6th of November, 2014. All right, so she's almost uh, three years. Uh, very uh, young, actually, compared to uh, Watson. Um, and there are a couple of types of chatbots that we can identify. So flow chatbots are where the user is actually uh, taken and driven to, through a path. Then there are artificial intelligent chatbots uh, and hybrids, which combine uh, user features and artificial intelligence. So then there is also uh, different purposes of chatbots, like functional uh, specific program and a random like tell me a joke. Uh, and then there is the audience, which uh, can be also split in two. Um, Parts generalists. So, for example, you are uh, you have users coming from every background or specific. If you try to, for example, you make a chatbot for the Neo4j Slack, so you will have a very specific audience. Um, chatbots anatomy is mainly like this. So you have the user um, sending a request with natural language, actually, um, and then the to uh, define or guess the intent of the user. And this is done with uh, intent classification. 
we will come to this uh, a bit later. Uh, there is also entity recognition, uh, which is actually adding uh, more information to the intent of the user. Um, then there is context, so where the user is in the conversation and other additional context, like um, the, all the information you know about your user and the external uh, information, like the meteor, his position, um, et cetera. And then you have actually a multitude of possible responses to send to the user, and um, you have to actually score them and try to return to the user the most relevant possible response. The specificity with um, voice bots is that the user is speaking with voice, obviously. So there is a service in between that is translating um, voice to text, which what is what we call uh, speech to text. Uh, you have multiple uh, services like this, so Amazon Lex, for example, which is available standalone on the Amazon platform. On Siri itself, you can uh, program to uh, so you can take advantage of the Siri kit to uh, use the microphone, and you will get uh, a text. And IBM Watson, Microsoft, Lewis, etc., have exactly the same uh, features. Um, so yeah, let's start with our skill. So I was attending recently the Web Expo conference in Prague, and I did quickly um, a skill um, that is. Um, that will help user actually. So let's check the anatomy of what is making a skill. So for this demo now, we will say, okay, I want to have info about the company. For example, when is it happening? If I am at home and I don't remember the date. Um, so okay. let's ask Alexa. Alexa, open Web Expo. Welcome to the Web Expo conference. When is the conference happening? The Web Expo conference is happening on September 22nd and 23rd in Prague, Czech Republic. All right, so what is happening here is first the intent handling. So the Alexa service has to know um, what, when is the conference happening uh, means and what is the next action to actually do. Um, so in the um, Amazon, uh, interface, you can actually um, create a set of utterances um, that will define, for example, here the info intent. So you give Alex the Alexa service um, multiple sentences that will describe how the user is expected to invoke um, this skill. So here we can say, okay, at what date is the conference? In what country? Where? When? Uh, Etc. So you you give hints, and then this will pass through a machine learning pipeline, and when it recognizes your text and get the uh, your speech and retrieve the text of it, uh, it will try to classify um, the intent of the user. So info, and this is sent. Uh, so the info. Intent is actually sent from the Alexa service to your skill API. So when you build a custom skill, you can either create your own um, quick API service on Heroku, for example, or you can use AWS uh, Lambda, which works also pretty well. Uh, it depends on the language and platform uh, you want to use. So you can see actually here. Uh, we have an intent request coming from Alexa, sent by Alexa, actually. And the intent name that she found is info. So what will happen on our site? We will actually parse this JSON and react to how we want to build a response for this uh, particular uh, request. Here, it is very... Uh, simple, you can actually hard code the response in your code um, and uh, return a response. So um, this is a hypothetical um, code. So if the 
intent name is info, you return a new response with uh, this text. And this text is making the reverse process of a speech to text. It is going from text to speech over the Alexa device, and then the Alexa device is um, speaking uh, to you. So yes, if you are doing this, and then you go back home, and you can say to your wife, today I did artificial intelligence. It's a joke, of course. So this is an example of the response that is sent by my API uh, to the Alexa service, which will be transformed to speech to the Alexa device. So here, output speech should be this, and the type is uh, in plain text. So here, we saw that um, the intent detection is uh, handled by the Alexa service, but there are tools with Neo4j um, where you can actually train a model to have this classification inside the graph. And there are a couple of advantages for it. So um, let's say that this is a very simple CSV file where I have the action and the utterance. So here, setting, the user would say that. Merge, the user would say that. Greeting, by, etc. So what is happening? You feed the CSV into a model trainer, and then you can ask for a classification. So with a CSV, it is pretty obvious and simple. But the advantage with um, is that you can actually train continuously your model based on the activity in your graph. So you can, um, here, for example, I am trying to find all the nodes in my name that are locations. And then I can say, OK, if the user is, is um, telling show me a picture from and then the location name, it should be the intense uh, show picture. So you can actually train this um, data into the graph. And then you can get a classification, actually. So you can ask for classification, your the name of your model, and the user sentence. Uh, and it will return show picture, uh, which is very, very interesting, because you can fine tune continuously um, the, the intent detection. But also, you, with this, you can also send requests to the Amazon Alexa service and fine tune the Alexa service uh, itself. Um, yeah, let's go back to the slide. Um, yeah. So now we will speak about entities. And especially in Alexa, it is uh, named uh, slots. So what are uh, entities? It is actually an additional information relevant to the user intent. So what do we, um, uh, yeah, let's take an example from it. Uh, I open the my conference assistant, and I'm uh, asking, OK, what is the next talk about business? And this business uh, world is very, very important um, for us, because it allows us to actually have a starting point uh, in our database uh, when we do when we handle this particular intent. So we can see here, based on the iterants, that we can create another intent, for example, uh, session time or session next session, uh, for example. Uh, so the first things, of course, is to create your intent in Amazon Alexa. And uh, with here, under the curly brackets, you can say, OK, the user is expected to give um, a topic uh, word. So we, we can actually. Um, provide a list of those topics to the, to the Alexa service, uh, or give two or three of them, and then handle it on the, on the skill API level. Again, what is very useful is that with the graph, you can, for example, uh, continuously train, again, the Alexa service via the SDK. Um, so let's make uh, a quick. Um, Test so, um, so the this is what the user will will ask, and this is how it will uh, come to the 
uh, to your API. So I will just uh, restart the locks. So let's try it again. Alexa, open Web Expo. Welcome to the Web Expo conference. What is the next session about business? The next session about business is leadership through change. 10 things to explore the possibilities of the future now. Thank you. You are welcome. Bye bye. All right. So, as we can see, this is how the Alexa service will send you the request. It sent you um, uh, the topic uh, slot value, actually. So you can handle this and actually query the graph um, with uh, this topic. So if we look here um, in the graph, okay, match the topic. Topic, all right, business, and we have our session here, and we know when it starts. So it starts at 10. Uh, so we, depending on the time, we can filter with a simple query, uh, and then return the response uh, to the user. Next, now this is very simple. Actually, you may you. Maybe even need, don't need a database for this simple um, exchange with Alexa. So, but the future is not having our coded message into our API, but mainly to allow the user to have a conversation with the user. Actually, and this is uh, we need to understand the user, and this is done with natural language understanding. So, I will uh, make a slight. Um, Introduction to how at Graphra we tackle natural language understanding, but bear in mind that um, we can actually talk about this during uh, five days online meetup. Uh, so it it will be a very um, small part of the system. Uh, yeah, it is a very complex actually field in computer science. Um, so natural language understanding is actually a subfield of natural language processing. And it, the main goal is to allow a machine uh, to comprehend what the machine is reading. So mainly to, it is human understanding. Uh, but this is considered as an artificial intelligence heart uh, problem. Um, and so first, the first step, of course, is to do natural language processing. So how do we do this uh, at Graphware? We have actually. Uh, Natural language processing plugin atop Neo4j. So you just pass um, documents that you in a pipeline. So this is done with a very simple procedure. Um, I will show it uh, very soon. Um, and what this procedure will do is it will do first the basic um, steps of natural language processing, which are sentence segmentation, tokenization, nematization, uh, removing stop words, uh, part of speech tagging. Entity recognition, etc. So, uh, if we take, for example, here this uh, sentence. So I will maybe uh, go here. Uh, sentence. And so I have actually the view of how this sentence is represented into uh, way after the natural language processing pipeline. So first. Um, Tokens are actually taken to the root. So we have here making, but it is taken from make. Um, you can see also that there is this VBG, which is a verb, actually. So we can detect um, that this is a verb in a sentence. And then there is the entity recognition. For example, here, we can define that location is uh, Oregon, for, sorry, is a location, as is United States. We can also detect that uh, August 21 is a date in the sentence. Um, and this is very useful, actually, for understanding uh, unstructured text uh, data. Um, then there is another post-processing steps, uh, which actually will try to 
find semantic rules. So semantic rules, here it is a screenshot from IBM Watson, um, but it is also commonly named as a subject ac action object triples. Uh, so we can find actually facts about uh, every sentence. Here uh, you can see that um, it finds the action and the subject, um, but, sorry, um, yeah, so I will show later, um, I will actually show it now. Uh, here, in Neo4j, let's go again here. As you, all right, so this is here. Hmm. So here we can, there is a sentence which is uh, here, a plain HTTP server can handle about 25k requests per second, while Express and Happy can serve respectively up to 8k and 2k requests per second. Um, and the, the SVO, one of the SVO font, for example, is HTTP server can handle Happy serve and can serve. So, uh, this produces facts actually about the uh, sentence of um, your data. Another uh, field in NLU is actually the syntactic analysis, and we also can call this um, typed dependencies in the sentence. So, if you look, this is done. This is a screenshot taken from Stanford uh, NLP, and if you look at this, you can you actually have a dependency graph uh, of your sentence. And of course, uh, we will use Neo4j to um, store this information. And why do we use um, graphs for natural language understanding? Well, actually, this is um, the very point of it is that with those SVO trappers that can uh, travel that are into the graph and the graph the type dependencies that are also into the graph, you can actually match, uh, try to find the graph matching from a question to a sentence. So if you look here, for example, you have, we have a sentence, what book did the Russell Carson wrote, uh, write in 1962? You can decompose this dependency, the graph, and here you have the actual uh, sentence in the corpus, and in 1962, Russia Carson wrote Silent Spring. And so you can find the minimal um, graph, uh, subgraph matching, and then find actually the highest possible uh, response in it. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with graphs, and especially Neo4j, I have a very, very uh, quick intro, uh, four or five slides. So in Neo4j, everything is, um, uh, so this is the property graph model. So every object is actually represented uh, as a node, and nodes can be labeled. So here we see that there is a person and a car, and relationships between objects are stored as relationships. Uh, so they have a type and a direction, and both um, nodes and relationships can have properties uh, which are key value pairs, actually. Um, the advantage with Neo4j is that first it is whiteboard friendly, so uh, everything that you uh, actually draw on a whiteboard would be stored as it is in 99% of the use case in your graph. Uh, so if you just have a high level of how you wanted, you would recommend the movies to a person, which is a very typical use case, you just have to draw something on the whiteboard and you can actually detect. Um, what to recommend to a user. For example, you could say, okay, find me what I watch and what other what other people having watched the same movie as me are watching also. So this is very simple to do with a graph. Um, of course, here we have a very simple graph with seven nodes and a couple of relationships. But in the real world, uh, your graph would look uh, like this. Um, this is a production graph I have, a sc screenshot for it 
from uh, GitHub. Uh, so actually, this is very difficult to um, analyze data with, uh, with this kind of visualization. So you need a way to very easily query your data. And this way is actually the Cypher query language, which is a graph pattern matching language. So instead of um, asking how to retrieve data into the graph, you would better ask what data you want out from the graph. So here we see that there is a match, which is kind of selected in SQL. And between parentheses, you define nodes. And between square, um, square brackets, you define relationship. And oh, this query would return actually this pattern from the graph. Um, and the use case of Neo4j are, of course, very popular recommendation engine for detection, network analysis, etc. And one of, for us, of the biggest use case is knowledge graph, which uh, if you take text from a structured data and you gather insights from it, uh, this will help you to actually um, go further with conventional uh, experience, uh, like with Alexa or chatbots, based on the knowledge of the text data you have into the graph. Um, so yeah, as I said, we will store, oh, sorry, the actual typed dependencies um, into the graph. And if you look at um, this particular sentence, for example, this is how it would actually look into Neo4j. But I have it uh, here, actually. Um, another sentence, so um, you have your original text and this node would be like a mirror of your original data, which would which will hold the uh, NLP information about this partic particular um, node. So it is composed into sentences. Sentences have uh, tags. So if I take here tag value value, uh, so here about pressure business. But if I take um, a lesson, no, a session, for example, graph here. So I can see here I have four sentences, which are actually the decomposition of the abstract of the session at the conference. And every session has is decomposed into uh, every sentence, sorry, is decomposed into tags. So if you think about it, uh, a very simple way of finding, of relating a query to an original corpus in, an original sentence in a corpus in your data, uh, a first idea with simple traversing the graph would be to find, to start from a question, finding the tokens, tags, um, and traverse the graph to find actually um, which other, um, I mean, if you start from a question, which um, sessions are, have the most uh, tag in common? And you can have a simple, actually, TFIDF um, first uh, similarity uh, between the question and your user, your original uh, corpus. So let's just take, uh, for example, a question here. Uh, so we can see that, OK, I remove the what is, because this is useless for generally in the graph. Um, so we can say here that we have about pressure business. So if I expand um, pressure, for example, um, oh, where is, all right. If I expand business, I can see that it is actually related to four other, four or five other sentences in the original corpus. So then the goal will be to um, score, if you return the sentence on the application level, would be to score them based on some uh, actual other rules, so based on your business rules. Or sometimes you will have a very high results depending on the number of uh, different tags that are matching together. Um, let's go further. So what uh, this 
natural language understanding or processing combined with graphs will help us to do. So it will help us to do uh, two things mainly. The first thing is context handling. So if um, the user is speaking to your device or to your bot, you don't want him to actually um, have to always redo the same conversation flow uh, if he wants to know more about uh, what you just said. So let's take an example. For example, uh, what is the next session about business? Uh, I don't want to uh, say again this for asking who is the speaker and who is the when is the session actually happening? Um, so this is what we call the bot amnesia effect. So, uh, so for example, I say, uh, Alexa, what is the next session about business? I get the response, and then I say, who is speaking? And the reply will be, sorry, I don't know how to handle that. So this is not um, useful and friendly for the for your user. The Think also with, for example, a device like Alexa is that um, you have 30 seconds to actually be able to ask a question for other information. Um, but in 30 seconds, it can happen a lot of things. Your phone can ring, the pizza delivery can be there. So you, you will have to restart the whole conversation. So um, this is not friendly to uh, use this uh, at the application level. So we will see first how uh, it works. Uh, so this is uh, the typical example uh, who is speaking. And Alexa, sorry, I don't know that. So um, uh, oh, wrong slide. Um, yeah. So first, see with the Alexa site uh, how it works. So Alexa, open Web Expo. Welcome to the Web Expo conference. What is the next session about business? The next session about business is leadership through change. Ten things to explore the possibilities of the future now. Who is speaking? The speaker is Tom Goodwin. At what time? It starts at 10. Thank you. You are welcome. Bye-bye. So you can see here on the right that every time I was uh, asking more questions, I had this exchange between the Alexa service and my API. So you have this session attributes, actually, uh, where you can, um, from the your skill API, pass attributes that will be passed again uh, to the next uh, request. Uh, so here, the first time I replied with the next session is and the title of the session. I added a session attribute, which is the session ID, which is actually the ID of the session node in my database. And so next time, when I say who is speaking, I just have to do um, a, a match session ID and get the speaker uh, name uh, back. Again, the who is speaking uh, is an intent defined in the Alexa service. So um, the second. So this is for context. Uh, this is so working well, but it works only during 30 seconds after every time Alexa replies to you. Um, OK. Um, yeah. So the second thing is allowing freedom to the user. How we will allow freedom? So I was speaking about those um, uh, subject action object generation into the graph. Um, so here we see that yeah, it's better with those sites actually. Um, we see that this is from IBM Watson, and we actually our NLP um, a plugin. This we get a more um, subject uh, subject action object uh, triples, um, and this is very fine because uh, we can really go further actually. So we. If you figure on a triple, it is the what do what uh, triple. So, but there are things into the graph and into this NLP information you have um, 
that can enrich actually those triples. So if you think um, about this sentence, all right, so you have action which contains United States object who contains uh, August 21, but you know that you will have actually those uh, named entity recognition, which will be location and which will be date. So you can actually go further from a triple uh, to extend to a five or six or seven tuples uh, uh, with when, with whom, with where. Uh, so you can actually really enrich the knowledge of the facts of the sentence you have uh, into the graph. Um, so this is how we. This is one of the rules we did because so we analyzed like more than two dozen sentences to understand how we could enrich uh, those subject action uh, objects, uh, and we can actually enrich uh, those. So here, based on the same sentence, I find that there is a possible location and date. So instead of having uh, as I say, the what do what, I have what to do, what, when, where. Here. Uh, uh, Christoph, question. Did you, did you train them all uh, manually? You go and tag them all yourself, or was there some sort of... So they, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I will... Uh, so the, we analyzed manually some sentences, uh, more than two dozen approximately, to find actually the rules for uh, making the cipher queries to find the possible enrichment. But there is uh, another pipe of machine learning where uh, I will come back uh, later, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, it allows freedom uh, to us. So we can actually, we don't have to uh, actually define all those intents. Uh, I mean, some of them we have to, but uh, all those intents into the Alexa service, because then you will have like 200, 300 thousands of intents to manage, and it is, um, very, very uh, uh, expensive operation. If you, for example, would be building a question answer uh, system, I mean, it would be impossible to handle all possible sentences that the user would say. Um, so uh, here, let's make a test and uh, let's see what happened. So first, uh, there is a simple trick in the Amazon Alexa service uh, because when you get the request, in contrary to some other APIs like uh, Google or SiriKit, you don't get what Alexa actually understood, or what we call the highest confidence uh, sentence. Uh, so you just get the uh, uh, classified intent, which is um, a bit sad. So there are a lot of uh, user requests for this on the Alexa, on the Alexa support. Uh, so there is a simple trick is that you defined an utterance with a simple slot. So it, actually, the uh, the slot value will be what Alexa understood. The drawback to this is that you will lose the uh, intent detection from the Amazon Alexa service, which, I mean, uh, is available for free. You don't have to keep your machine learning pipeline on. Uh, so this is why we built the machine learning uh, classification. Uh, inside Neo4j itself um, to be able to handle this. Uh, so here, if we look, um, so let's take here Alexa. Sorry. Alexa, open Web Expo. Welcome to the Web Expo conference. Is someone talking about business pressure? I found one session about business pressure, how to tame technical debt when under pressure from business challenges. So what we will get with, um, it's, I will just expand a bit now, um, is, uh, it is not locked. So actually, what I will receive from the, uh, from Alexa is this. So I will have to handle this. So if uh, you look at this, um, this is, again, how we can uh, traverse the graph to find again. Um, but uh, here, there are also 
this context of enrichment. Because if the user can say the same thing with different uh, words. So uh, we added the possibility also in the NLP plugin to uh, enrich the knowledge of your graph. I will give you a simple example. Let's say you have two documents of text, one speaking about uh, San Francisco and one speaking about Los Angeles. Uh, based on text data, there is nothing that will relate those two texts. Um, so you need a way to uh, relate to know that they are actually related because they're not far. So with uh, knowledge enrichment with API like um, ConceptNet 5 or Microsoft Concept Graphs, etc., you can now say, say, okay, Los Angeles and San Francisco are in California. So those two documents are speaking about something happening in California. Um, there are also uh, real cool ways uh, with the Microsoft Concept Graphs to know, for example, if you have a sentence with apple and banana, you know that apple is a fruit in this particular sentence. But if you have Apple and iPhone 7, we actually could detect that the Apple in this actual sentences uh, is a company. So this will allow um, the user to um, uh, say the same thing with different words. And more for us, it allows us to uh, better understand the user. For example, uh, if we would find tags uh, with uh, picture, but the user, so if, for example, in Notex it is picture, of course, if we have picture here as a node uh, and the user is saying photograph, then we will lose actually uh, a very important uh, a word said by the user. If you say, okay, show me a picture from Oregon, okay, and there is no uh, picture word in our text, but photograph, then we will not match fully. But if we can say, okay, uh, picture is related to photograph, then we will be able to actually extend uh, our starting point in the graph. So here, same thing, we can say, okay, business is related to enterprise, to activity, institution, commerce, organization, etc. So this is another feature of um, the NLP plugin. Um, so yeah, allowing freedom, uh, blah, blah, so. So what we will do is we will also, so we, this is one thing, comparing tags. You can also compare the SVO between the original corpus and, uh, and the text, uh, the, sorry, the original corpus and the query. Uh, and this is actually an example of a query we are doing. Uh, this is very hypothetical because I um, actually compress this query into one slide, but actually I am making four or five different queries uh, from the API. Uh, and then I score it on the application level with some um, user-defined, I mean, my rules sometimes. Um, then this is a very interesting problem. This is the challenge with voice. Oh, sorry, this is not wrong. So I will take another example today. This was the example from another um, use case. Uh, for example, I say, Alexa, open Web Expo. Welcome to the Web Expo conference. Is there a session with title Cypher? There is one session with title Cypher, deep dive in Cypher query language presented by Michael Hunger. So this is very nice, but we have a lot of expectation, actually that cipher with the epsilon uh, as we know it uh, would be understood by Alexa. But actually, this is coming like this. This is the slot that Alexa understood, cipher with an I. But we will never find this token actually into our graph. So standard, uh, if you can think, for example, about Levenstein distance, or for helping you, but for voice, it doesn't work at all because the phonetic uh, are very different. So thanks uh, to the Neo4j team and especially um, Michael Hunger, uh, Epoch is actually fitted with phonetic, with the Sondex phonetic algorithm. So what you um, 
will do. This is not here, not here. All right, so what does phonetic means? It will actually make an alpha numeric representation of the phonetic version of a word. So if we take here cipher with an I and cipher with a epsilon, this, is, this has actually the same pronunciation. So instead of matching by whole um, for voice, for how uh, token is written, is better to match for how uh, token sound. Uh, and you could actually do fuzzy match on the phonetic uh, version as well. So here, for example, if I would uh, find a session that contains cipher uh, in the title, I would get this because uh, I'm taking um, the phonetic version of the token. So, for, so for every tag, we do the, uh, we add the phoneme uh, on it, and we you can match uh, with the phoneme. So this is a um, very interesting area because I never used Sondex uh, before, actually, in my career. Um, yeah, there are a couple of tips for voice design. First one is for the iterances. Uh, you better get real usage utterance. So you better get to your business people and say, OK, what the user will say? What do you know? What are your logs of history, et cetera? Uh, if you are actually a startup, it is better to actually go into the blind and lock as much as possible the user and train rapidly, uh, react rapidly to the new logs uh, you get. And the second thing is um, put a lot of effort in failure handling. Uh, what I mean is, um, for example, Alexa, ask Web Expo, what is the next session about business? The next session about business is leadership through change. Ten things to explore the possibilities of the future now. You're stupid. Well, I was made by a human. All right. So if you don't handle this failure, the, you're stupid, then what will happen is uh, you will all return completely um, unexpected responses or a response like, sorry, I don't know how to handle that. And this will actually break completely uh, the experience of the user. So as I said also, string matching. And we're not there yet, but we believe that the future of uh, building conversation experience is to do uh, what you did during 20, 30, 40 years uh, is actually having a conversation. But really, we're not there yet, but we are working on it. Um, yeah. So Neo4j NLP, I spoke a lot about it uh, during this uh, presentation. Um, stay tuned. This will be open sourced uh, on Monday. Um, and uh, yeah, just follow us on graphroy.com or on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, it's coming. Uh, Monday. Um, and yeah, we will be present at GraphConnect. So if you want to have a sneak, um, so you saw the Knowledge Studio quickly. Um, so yeah, this is what we'll be presenting at GraphConnect. So we help, we have a platform for um, knowledge management and uh, cognitive computing, uh, so we can actually help you build chatbots and uh, very easily. Um, so here, Victor from Oregon, and um, uh, yeah. So if you want a demo at GraphConnect, just come to the Graph or a boot, and yeah. Uh, thank you. I hope you have a couple of questions. Cool. And um, so thanks to Christoph. And if you liked uh, the talk, don't forget to hit the like button on the video. Uh, we had we had some questions as we went along. Uh, so one was 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 about when is the NLP library going to be available? So I guess you just right. answered that. Uh, there was another one uh, near the beginning from Adam who was asking. Um, this was when you were doing the training. Your sentences to uh, the cipher query. Yep. So his question is. Can you map an utterance or slot to any value in the graph, or do you need to explicitly train for each one? No, 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 no. So you can uh, um, actually what you 
what you do is uh, you can take, um, for example, just three or four of possible values. This is what you will do in, when doing a, uh, when creating a CSV to import into Neo4j. But when the data is actually into the graph, uh, you can take all. But this will help either, I mean, for example, if you send this information to the Alexa service, this will also help the Alexa service to understand and return you the right slot, but also return in a good manner. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you don't have to specific, uh, create a line of returns for every possible slot. Um, but um, I mean, too much is not good, but you need to tune, test. I mean, there is no magic. You need to you need to test and measure. So this is uh, uh, this is not magic. This is for everything. Cool. And I guess if, if anybody is watching this afterwards, if you have any questions, you can go to neofj.com forward slash Slack. That's our, where our uh, user community lives. And you can go to the Neo4j online meetup channel and ask uh, any questions there. Christoph, is, I think it's probably already in the channel anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know. We don't seem to have any questions today. It's a quiet, oh, what? Okay. quiet group. So I guess we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. So thanks again to... <laughs> To Christoph, and if you're in uh, New York in three or four weeks' time, don't forget to come and watch. Are you doing a talk there as well, or only, only on the, the booth? I have a lightning uh, talk about um, the same thing. Cool. But I, I'm also having a session the whole day about Cypher performance in the developer zone. And we will have, uh, actually, an Amazon Echo Show uh, at the booth. So we will show you, uh, as well, um, uh, skills, but with images and uh, Touch interaction. Okay. Cool. That sounds fun. So developers alone. Where the kind of you want to want to meet Christoph? Uh, sure. Cool. All right. Uh, I guess we'll wrap up there then. So thanks again and uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks, Mark. Uh, see you next time. See. You. Thank you.